In this video presentation, we're going to demonstrate Harmony's capabilities for well performance analysis in the presence of significant uncertainty. To do this, we're going to use uh, the unconventional reservoir module. The unconventional reservoir module is applicable in two modes. One of them is deterministic, one is most likely. The deterministic methodology provides one single output uh, in the presence of inputs that are uh, supplied as specified numbers. And that's normally the way that we do things when we do production analysis. The other option here though is called the most likely uh, methodology and that's what we're going to focus on in this presentation. In this uh, implementation of the unconventional reservoir module, we provide inputs that are ranges instead of specific answers. And as a result, we can get an output that is also a range of different answers. And we can do this very simply and get a what we can call a most likely or P50 result by um, taking the uh, middle ground of all of those likely results. Before we get into the analysis, let's take a look at the data for this particular example that we're going to run. This is an oil well in the Eagleford. As you can see, there's a lot of noise in the data. This is pretty typical for uh, an unconventional liquids rich play. It's due to instabilities in the wellbore and operational issues. So that's why we get a lot of noise in the gas rates and oil rates and in our flowing pressures. Let's take a look at the analysis. Before we generate the most likely uh, unconventional reservoir module, we're first going to look at a very simple flow regime identification. This is done with our standard unconventional reservoir module approach. We have four plots shown up here, our square root of time plot, flowing material balance plot, type curve, and forecast. Uh, for, for the purposes here, we're, we're simply going to look at the square root of time plot and flowing material balance analysis. The square root of time plot shows us a um, somewhat of a straight line behavior. You know, there is multiple interpretations of, of this data because there's a lot of noise, but there's no reason to think that we've seen any boundaries here. Uh, so we're going to assume a straight line behavior, which is what we'd expect in a, a tight fractured play. The straight line analysis gives us our A root K and also uh, gives us a sense for the completion efficiency, which is the Y intercept on this plot. We can also set the dotted green line, which is our minimum drainage volume to the end of the data. This will be consistent with an extrapolation of the flowing material balance plot, which gives us a minimum uh, drainage uh, area, minimum SRV, uh, in terms of a volume and an area. Those numbers will become important as seeding parameters for our most likely analysis that we're going to take a look at next. Before we actually get to the most likely analysis methodology, I'd like to talk a little bit about the concept behind it. Uh, before we get started, we're going to take a look at the um, what we call the parameter space. Uh, the parameter space being the range of different possibilities for this model. When we talk about a multi-fractured horizontal well, the assumption that we typically make is that we have a horizontal well bore that is intersected with transverse fractures. So there's a very clear relationship in a model like this between the fracture total fracture surface area and the drainage area. The total fracture surface area is shown in the schematic on the left hand side as these gray regions that are connected together and the drainage area is a plan view uh, shown from the top down of how that uh, total drainage from fracture tip to fracture tip would develop. Um, clearly as the fracture length changes the drainage area will also change and if, if it grows the, fra the drainage area will grow um, and the total uh, uh, fracture area will also grow at the same rate. So there's a very clear relationship between AX and AD uh, and they're linked by that fracture half length uh, parameter. If we were to plot an allowable region of total fracture area and drainage area, um, we could end up uh, with a region that's shown like this. Now this region is created as a result of putting limitations on um, how big or small the drainage area could be. For example, in the analysis that we looked at previously, we identified the minimum drainage area. We don't think that, there are, that it's likely that the well could be draining, draining anything less than this vertical line based on our interpretation of that production data. So that line creates the left-hand side of this box. The right-hand side of this box is created by uh, assuming that we won't be able to drain anything outside of the well spacing, which is a pretty good assumption. 
Now we may not know what the ultimate well spacing is going to be, so we want to be conservative about um, coming up with a number for this. Let's move on from here. Uh, we can also define a linear relationship between uh, the growth of the total fracture area and the growth of the drainage area. Um, this is simply a relationship based on number of fractures, the height of the fracture, and the total uh, horizontal well length. Um, in this scaling factor, the unknown value, primary unknown value is NF. We don't know how many uh, of the fractures are contributing. For example, if we have a, a plug and perf type completion, um, there may be multiple perf clusters per stage, and we don't know how many of those are necessarily contributing to the overall fracture area. So we can generate two lines. The red line is uh, an assumption, a pessimistic assumption that says we're only getting one effective fracture created per stage. Uh, so we get a linear relationship between uh, interfacial area and drainage area here. Um, the other one is a little more optimistic and says, well, the maximum possible surface area that could be created would happen uh, under the assumption that we're getting a fracture for every single perf cluster that's been placed. And the true solution will lie probably somewhere in between this, uh, this wedge that's created by these two lines. If we combine the linear relationship wedge between interfacial area and drainage area and the box or the bounds that we've created based on the minimum and maximum drainage area due to investigated drainage and well spacing, we can enclose an area here that's shown in yellow and make the assumption that um, any combination of uh, parameters within this region is acceptable and parameters that fall outside of this region would probably not be acceptable and would not, would not be reasonable reservoir models for this system. So we've now constrained uh, the solution space, so, so to speak, of where we would want to investigate uh, possible uh, reservoir models for the data that we have. We can actually further constrain this uh, box by putting permeability limitations on this as well. Now there's a well-known relationship between permeability and total fracture area that we can take advantage of as well. And if we have independent estimates or independent measurements of permeability, we can use that to further confine this allowable space. Um, the uh, permeability may be measured from core analysis or it may be um, from a DFIT test or something like that. Once we've uh, defined the space, uh, we can very simply find, um, for example, the most likely uh, point, which we've identified as being the centroid of this region. Uh, we can think of this as the combination of two separate triangular distributions, one for the drainage area and one for the interfacial area. And the most likely uh, point is the centroid of that space. The mode for this um, uh, region is occurs at the peak of the two triangles. So those are at two different uh, locations. But when we report uh, what we're going to call the P50 parameters and P50 forecast, we're going to do it at this location. And then finally, we, we can show the whole picture together. The yellow space represents the uh, defined or allowable region. Uh, the P50 or centroid is located uh, somewhere in the middle of that point. So let's go back to the Harmony software. And we'll take a look at our analysis again. We're going to go and create one of these uh, um, most likely unconventional reservoir modules now for oil. So let's go and do that. We're going to use the superposition time formulation because it's a little more um, uh, accurate for determining A root K. Okay, so we start with our straight line analysis here. We're required to put some inputs. Uh, the horizontal well length for this particular well is 5366. Uh, we're going to use 500 feet for our well spacing. These are really the only two deterministic inputs in the program. Um, the next thing we want to do is enter in minimum and maximum permeability constraints. I'm going to make these constraints very, uh, these limits very wide because we really have no idea. Um, well, we have a, an, um, some sort of idea of the range of permeabilities, but we're going to keep that very uh, cautious and allow for um, a few orders of magnitude in, uh, in investigating the, the range of permeabilities. So we're going to make the minimum uh, one nanodarcy and the maximum a thousand uh, nanodarcies. 
Uh, for number of fractures minimum, this is a plug and perf style uh, completion. Um, uh, fairly uh, straightforward what we do for minimum and maximum fracture uh, uh, density. For the minimum, we're going to assume that we only have one fracture per stage, and that will give us 16 fractures. This is a 16 stage completion. For the maximum, we're going to assume 80 uh, because there are five perf clusters per stage. And then immediately after we've entered these inputs, um, it generates our yellow uh, region. Uh, as we can see, the permeability barriers or the permeability bound boundaries are outside of that wedge, so they really don't even come into play. But if we had uh, better estimates on permeability, let's say for example we had done some defit testing and we had found that the maximum is somewhat less, I'll bring that down to e to the minus 4, and the minimum was somewhat greater, uh, we can start to uh, d uh, uh, make that yellow uh, drainage or that, that yellow allowable region much smaller and, and get a much more reliable um, estimate of, of where the most likely result is going to be. So it always helps to have better uh, input constraints. The more that we can constrain our um, uh, range of either permeability, uh, NF, and we didn't talk about fracture height, but we can also put constraints on fracture height. We're assuming that that's a deterministic value right now. In reality, that's not the case. We, we may want to put um, a range on, on these numbers as well. Um, but at the end of the day, we want to come up with a realistic uh, yellow region here, defining what we think the range of possible solutions for drainage area and total fracture area are going to be. So let's move that up a little bit just to make sure that we have a, a valid um, match there. Okay, so we've got our square root straight line, and we've got our schematic showing the um, most likely result. Uh, at the end here, we can show the forecast, and the forecast is going to illustrate the minimum result and the most likely result, which are separated by quite a large uh, gap at the moment. Um, one thing we also want to check to make sure that we have selected properly here is our minimum value. So let's go back to our flow regime ID where we've indicated we have six acres of um, area, uh, drainage area as a minimum. So I'm going to go back to here and make sure that that's reflected here as well. Make that a little bit bigger. Okay, so that's our minimum drainage area uh, shown there. And our maximum is based on our assumption of 500 uh, foot spacing between the wells. So that is our way of determining our most likely forecast. Um, as we can see, What's kind of nice about this is the P50, or most likely forecast, is not uh, enormously sensitive to the minimum. Uh, as I collect more data and change the position of that minimum uh, drainage area, the most likely forecast, which is shown in red up here, actually doesn't change that much. The minimum forecast changes significantly uh, as I add more data, uh, which makes it very sensitive to the point in time that I choose to do the analysis, which is somewhat arbitrary. The most likely result uh, does change uh, a little bit as I move that green line forward, but it's the, the magnitude of its change is small compared to uh, the minimum forecast. This makes this a huge advantage when trying to come up with a forecast with, uh, when we only have very early time data. Or when we're trying to compare forecasts between wells that have three months of production data and wells that have six months or eight or nine months of production data we get a fair comparison when we use this most likely approach.